Hey guys, how's it going? So it's been two months, and I have to say my obsession with this thing has not gone away yet. So given that she hasn't left my brain for two months, I figure now is as good a time as any to tackle a pretty in-depth character in Vincent Van Gogh. Now, naturally, I will not be covering the other aspects of Van Gogh, as I've already talked about them at length in a couple of other videos linked here. So today is dedicated to the tragic life led by the sunflower Dutchman Van Gogh. I would like to begin by just warning all of you that this is not a fun story. You can find comedy in some tragedy because a person was either bad or deserving of their fate, or simply out of the absurd nature of their tragic life. This story is not that. Pretty much from the get-go, this story is one of sadness and the cruelty of mental illness and harsh upbringing. With that said, it is still a story worth telling, so let us continue. Personally for me, the sunflower is my favorite flower, being both beautiful and terrifying in one fell swoop. This actually serves as a decent analogy to the painter's life. On the 30th of March 1853, Vincent William Van Gogh was born in the Netherlands. He was the oldest surviving child of Pastor Theodorus Van Gogh, and inherited the name of his stillborn sibling who died on the 30th of March 1852. Both of his parents were incredibly religious and not exactly wealthy on their own. However, the family did benefit from their father's position, having a home and several luxuries above their pay class. Vincent was born a very serious child, and thanks to his mother's influence was deeply faithful and religious, as well as incredibly family-oriented. As such, in 1864, when he was sent off to school alone and away from his family, he felt betrayed and abandoned. He was very vocal about his resentment but was not brought home, and instead made to attend a different school in Tilburg where he continued to just be upset. However, during these bouts of anger and frustration, he found an outlet in art. His mother had always been a great supporter of his ability to draw, and as such, this may have been a large influencing factor that led him to his future career. Another early influence was his art teacher at Tilburg, a man named Constant Cornelius Huijesman. They really don't make names like they used to, huh? Huijesman was unique in the art world in that he believed that technique was unnecessary so long as you could capture the impression of things, especially those in nature. Despite this connection, Van Gogh would return home in 1868 due to his continued unhappiness. The following year, his uncle got him a job as an art dealer in The Hog, which I am sure I'm saying that wrong. Den Haag. But having a place called The Hog sounds sick as hell, so I'm going to run with it. He took to this job well, and by the time that he was 20, he was actually earning more than his father. While this was certainly a happy time, it was very short-lived. He had become infatuated with his landlord's daughter, but unbeknownst to him, she was already engaged, and thus he was rejected. This seems to have soured life yet again for Van Gogh, who then took more deeply to his religious practices and began to isolate himself. He then began to become critical of his job as an art dealer and resented the purchasers for what he believed to be over-commodification of art, and thus Van Gogh was let go in 1875. He would find himself in England working an unpaid job in Ramsgate, but left his job to be a minister's assistant. This didn't pan out well for him either, and he moved back to his home and took a job at a bookstore, which he also disliked. Supposedly, he would often be found making doodles in books and translating Bible passages into three different languages. It was at this point that Van Gogh may have felt that he had more of a divine purpose and fell deeply into his religious studies. He became more and more pious, and his parents, in an attempt to support their son's choices, sent him off to live with his uncle in Amsterdam. He planned to enter the College of Amsterdam, but flunked out of the entrance exam, and then the following year failed a three-month course to become a pastor. Undeterred by his failures, he took up a job as a missionary in a poor mining town, where, in an attempt to show those around him that he was serious, gave up his given lodgings to be a homeless man in order to live closer to those that he was trying to help. This backfired, however, and he was dismissed from the position for behaving in a way unbecoming of a priest. Keep in mind, the likely thought process on Van Gogh's part was that Jesus acted in a similar way and was applauded for it, so this was more just religious corruption and the raised nose attitude of the church. He then walked 75 kilometers to Brussels and was then pressured by his parents to return home. He stayed with them until 1880, when his father became sick and told Van Gogh that he should place himself into a mental asylum. It was at this time when he was forced out of the house and now living with a minor that Van Gogh began noticing all the little things around him and recording them through drawings. It was his brother Theo that suggested that Van Gogh take up art full time. At his the suggestion, he moved in with a painter who recommended him to Académie Royale des Bois Arts. The irony being that Van Gogh, even at the time, knew that art school was bullshit. However, he did attend and studied anatomy and perspective while there. In 1881, Van Gogh would return home where he would sketch everything around him. One day, his recently widowed cousin Cornelia Voss Stricker, also known as Key, visited the family. Key was seven years older than Van Gogh, but he was infatuated with her, and the pair spent a fair amount of time walking together. He went as far as to declare his love for her, which she promptly rejected him. After Key left, Van Gogh went to a different cousin, 
Anton Mauve, who was a successful artist in The Hog. They had good relations, and Mauve suggested that Van Gogh return some months later after practicing more. In the in-between, Van Gogh hadn't let go of his emotions for Key, and continually sent her letters that Van Gogh's own parents described as disgusting. Eventually, he stuck his hand into a lamp flame, declaring that he wished to look at Key for as long as his hand remained in the flame. Van Gogh himself claims that he did not recall this incident, indicating that this was an episode of some kind. He was flat out told that due to his inability to support himself, it was impossible for him to marry Key. Never mind the cousin thing. This is important though because this type of mania and full on obsession would be something that followed Van Gogh for the rest of his life. Aimed at various things, mind you. He would move in with Mauve shortly after and was taught how to use watercolors and then oil paints. He took to oil painting especially well, but in less than two months he and Mauve had a falling out. This was for various reasons, but likely primarily a difference in practice. Eventually, Mauve cut communications altogether after learning that Van Gogh was in relations with a prostitute named Klesina Maria Hornick, or Cyan. She had two young children, and Van Gogh's father pressured him to abandon them, lest he make his own situation worse. While initially resistant, Van Gogh did leave them in 1883. After the separation and driven by loneliness, he returned to his parents' home. To attempt to curb his loneliness and make a living, he would continue to draw. He made sketches of the landscapes and the people around him, oftentimes using darker colors to set the tone of a bleak, somewhat gritty existence of the world that he saw. Despite this outlook, he did manage to find love with a woman named Margaret Begaman. Although, this was done seemingly reluctantly by him. That said, they decided that they should marry, but both families opposed the idea. This led to Margaret attempting suicide by overdose, but she was saved by Van Gogh, who rushed her to the hospital. He would also be contacted by Theo, that an art dealer was interested in some of Van Gogh's paintings. So he created what is largely considered his first masterpiece, the Potato Eaters, which depicted several peasants in an old house eating supper. It is a very moody piece with dark earthy colors in a dimly lit room with dirty people. After some time without any of his pieces selling, he asked Theo what was going on, to which he learned that because of the Impressionist movement that was going on in the art world, the darker setting and tone of Van Gogh's paintings were simply out of style. Despite that, his pieces did get publicly displayed for the first time in a window of an art dealer. Immediately after this good thing happened, he was accused of having his way with one of the peasant models who had become pregnant and thus forbidden from using peasants as models by local priests. I don't believe that this was actually true, because there's no documentation stating that Van Gogh has any children. To make matters worse for him, however, his father would also die shortly before all of this in 1885. Needing a change, he moved to Antwerp, where he lived above a paint shop nearly starving to death. He had to beg his brother Theo for money, and when he received it, rather than buying food, he would buy paint. His go-to meals consisted of bread, tobacco, and coffee, which was essentially my diet all throughout college. He began to study more in the ways of artist styles and the use of colors, studying ukiyo-e Japanese woodblock paintings in the works of Peter Paul Rubens. He would introduce aspects of both of these styles into his own works going forward. He would once again attempt to attend an art school at the Antwerp Academy of Fine Arts. This went horrifically badly for a number of reasons. One, his health was failing due to a potential bout of syphilis, excessive smoking and overdrinking. Two, Van Gogh despised formal education. As a teacher myself, I am painfully aware of these kinds of students constantly, and they are among the hardest to teach. Three, his style was seen as unconventional at the time, and he refused to follow the directions given. He would constantly argue with his teachers and even declare that one of them had never seen a young woman before. That full quote is amazing and is in reference to the teacher angrily ripping up a work done by Van Gogh because it portrayed a peasant girl opposed to the Venus de Milo. In response to the destruction of his work, Van Gogh said, quote, You clearly do not know what a young woman is like, goddammit. A woman must have hips, buttocks, a pelvis in which she can carry a baby. Which sounds and is misogynistic, but it's also 1886, and how that essentially translates today is that you need to draw the chicks hot. After this, he would leave Antwerp and go to Paris, contrary to the popular belief that he was expelled. He was not. He would live with his brother Theo for a time. It would paint portraits of his friends and family, as well as still lifes and locational paintings. He would also try his hand at trace painting and using Japanese ukiyo-e blocks. In fact, the Japanese textbook that I used for classes features one of these paintings in it while discussing the Japanese art fluence on the West. Van Gogh would also take a great deal of inspiration from Adolf Monticelli at the time, altering his art style further. It was during this time as well that he would join a proper artist circle, which is where we get a fair amount of his portraits from. This seemed to be one of the happier times for Van Gogh. With these newfound friends in art, they actually put on a proper exhibit of their works, while Van Gogh didn't sell any of these there, he did exchange some and was able to discuss with like-minded people the life and troubles of being an artist. For him, this must have been a time of joy, to be surrounded by people cut from the same cloth. Despite this, he grew tired of the busy Parisian life and decided to move once again. During his two years in Paris, he produced over 200 paintings. In an attempt to clean up his health, he settled at the coastal town of Arles and befriended a Danish man by the name of Christian Morier Peterson. It seemed that he enjoyed the new environment, but commented that it was almost otherworldly in comparison to the bustling streets of Paris. Perhaps this is what set his artistic mind ablaze because it was from this day that many of his most iconic paintings emerged. 
the yellow house, starry night over Ron, bedroom in Arles, and his infamous vase with 12 sunflower paintings were all made at this time. Wanting to have another artist close by, he pressured Gawain to come visit him and prepared by painting multiple still lifes of sunflowers and buying an additional bed and furniture for his friend. However, this went south incredibly fast as Van Gogh was the only one with seemingly any excitement about the prospect. During the several month stay, Gawain only completed a singular painting and treated Van Gogh harshly as though he were an inferior. This was much to the frustration and ire of Van Gogh, who only only wanted to be seen on equal footing as a friend. As tension between the two rose, something awful happened. Yes, we are going to talk about the ear. So we don't have a reliable narrator as to what happens next. Gawain is kind of an arrogant bastard, and he recounts his telling of things 15 years after the fact, and Van Gogh himself is mentally unwell. Thus, I will be presenting the facts of the case as best that I can. On the 23rd of December, 1888, Gawain had left the Yellow House to stay at a hotel. Van Gogh entered his room and claimed that he was hearing voices all around him. To get them to stop, he took a razor and severed his left ear from his head, causing an extreme amount of bleeding. Gawain claims that before these events occurred, Van Gogh had followed him as he left and rushed at him with the razor, which is more than likely a fabrication, because given Gawain's personality, he would have had Van Gogh arrested. Van Gogh would then bandage himself up and walk to a brothel where he handed the ear to a 17-year-old cleaning girl named Gabrielle, or Gabby, before leaving. This is where the popular theory of Van Gogh severing his ear to give to a love interest came from. The likelihood of him being involved romantically with a 17 year old who is not a night worker is highly unlikely. He would later be found unconscious by a police officer and rushed to a hospital where a doctor in training named Felix Ray would operate on him. From him we would get the sketch of what remained of Van Gogh's ear which appeared to be just the earlobe. Here's the kicker. Van Gogh doesn't remember any of it. He was diagnosed with acute mania and delirium and made to stay in a hospital. Gakuin would contact Theo about the incident and Theo would rush to Arles to see his brother. The day following the incident, December 24th, Theo had proposed to a love interest and then immediately left to see his brother, arriving on Christmas Day, 1888. I want you to take something into consideration here. Out of everything awful and manic that has happened to Van Gogh, his one true friend was his brother, who was likely the only one who truly cared for Van Gogh. Had Theo not been around, I wouldn't be talking about Van Gogh because he would be less than irrelevant aside from in a book about psychiatric breaks. I hereby make this request that you be a Theo to someone. As for Gawain, he told the police that if Van Gogh asked about him, he had left for Paris, and while they would continue to be in correspondence for some time, the pair would never meet in person again. Van Gogh would spend the next month in and out of the hospital while he hallucinated and was delirious. At this time as well, the town petitioned to have him leave, declaring him to be an insane person and too dangerous to be around. He would more or less drift until April of 1889 when he finally admitted himself to the asylum. During his time in the asylum, his art would go and take a turn, literally, by implementing swirls into his designs. He was given two cells one of which he used as a studio. He could take supervised walks but was otherwise limited in his interactions with the outside world. It was here, in the small cell of his asylum, that he painted his most prolific work, The Starry Night, by gazing out of his east window towards the town. This was actually a subject for his for more than 20 different paintings, but the Starry Night is the one that has been immortalized. Be it for its almost supernatural allure, to its wild and unorthodox use of swirls, this painting has captured the eyes and mind of appreciators of the fine arts for over 100 years. As he had no subjects to paint, he would paint copies of others' works in his own style. For about a year, Van Gogh lived like this until he had a major relapse into his depression, and in an attempt to buck this, he requests that Theo and his mother send him old sketches so that he may redo them, and we do see some of these now live with color. It was now in 1890, locked in a concrete cage with nothing to do but paint, that Van Gogh finally received some form of recognition. He was touted as a genius of art by Albert Arier, an influential art critic who had published his critiques in a well-read art magazine. This pushed Van Gogh's name further and he would be invited to participate in the Le XX's annual exhibition. Le XX was a group of well-known painters, so there would be a good deal of eyes on Van Gogh's work once again. At the dinner of this event, a Belgian member of the group named Henri de Gros insulted Van Gogh's submitted work and was met with such mass retaliation from the group that he was forced to leave it. Ten more of his works would be displayed at another major gallery, which was attended by Claude Monet, who said that Van Gogh's works were the best on display. In May of 1890, he would check himself out of the asylum, which is something I guess you could do, to move closer to Theo and live with a doctor named Paul Gotchet, who apparently specialized in helping mad artists. At this time, he became enraptured by the beauty of the rolling wheat fields and used them as a subject for many of his paintings. A fair amount of these would be left unfinished, while many of these certainly showed warmth, as time went on they began to represent a darker loneliness that he felt within himself, even being quoted as saying that he painted these to put his emotions into something other than words. On the 27th of July, 1890, Van Gogh went to paint in one of these wheat fields alone, as he did on several occasions. 
It is believed that he was working on finishing his painting The Gnarled Roots at this time. He produced a 7mm pistol and shot himself in the chest. The bullet missed all of his vital organs and bounced off of a rib but did not pass through his body. He then walked home and was promptly given over to two doctors. As neither was a surgeon, they were unable to remove the bullet but operated as best as they could. Theo rushed to his side where he found Van Gogh to be smoking a pipe and in a rather good mood surprisingly, but he soon fell victim to an infection left by the injury and rapidly deteriorated until he died next to his brother. According to Theo, his last words were, this suffering will last forever. Thus, Van Gogh died on the 30th of July, 1890, and he would be buried at the Avoir Savoy, which I just totally butchered. Theo himself was in poor health at the time, and the loss of his brother seemed to make this worse, and he too would die the following year. While not initially placed there, his body would be moved to rest next to his brother forevermore. So that was the life and death of Vincent Van Gogh. Like I said up top, not a fun story. Not comedic, just sad and depressing from beginning to end. As if his entire existence was followed by a somber, melodic cello. But the question does still remain. What the hell was wrong with him? This is a question that has plagued historians for years. What we know is that his bouts of madness were episodic. We know this because he was able to function in society fine for the most part, but oftentimes when he was having an episode, he would only be semi-lucid for them. The most commonly believed theory is that he suffered from an extreme bipolar disorder amplified by the fact that he was malnourished and an alcoholic. Others believe that it was some form of schizophrenia, attributing to the voices that he claimed to hear. Others still believe that he was epileptic and that he would simply just shut down. Regardless of all of this, Van Gogh was still seen as a brilliant mind, albeit only two months before his death and ever after. He is someone who had given everything to his work in order for them to prosper, only for them to be disregarded time and time again. In his entire life, we only know of one painting that Van Gogh managed to sell, the Red Vineyard of Arles. While it is possible he sold others and we are not aware of it, including a theory that he managed to sell a self-portrait, these are unconfirmed. But imagine that. He worked as an artist for almost half of his 37 years on this rock, and today is considered a master of his craft, but only ever managed to sell one painting, while being funded by his brother. It is a tragedy and one that is happening even today, but perhaps the allure of his art isn't just the visuals, but the man behind them as well, and the tale of horror that accompanies it. But that is it. Van Gogh is going in the books. Thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Let me know what you thought down below. If there is a character that you want me to cover in the future, please let me know down there as well. Do all the YouTube stuff. Check my links down below for the Discord, Twitch, and Twitter. But for now, guys, keep your chin up. Peace.